Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rochelle Cameron, and tonight I am here with you hosting COVID Cast JA, a production of the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica in association with our sponsors, NCB Group and JMMB Group. We are at episode 68, and tonight we're talking about the business of education. If this is your first time joining us, we encourage you to right now sign up for our weekly memo at SME, so SME at PSOJ.org. Our weekly memo will give you business tips, and it is it refers to the topic that we are talking about that week. And some of you are saying to yourself, wow, so you're at episode 68, which means that for, if I'm joining for the first time, I've missed 67 episodes. What am I going to do? If you've missed any of our episodes, you can go on to smallbusinessportal.com. That's smallbusinessportal.com. You can go to our YouTube page or on our Facebook page and you will see all our episodes. On smallbusinessportal.com, you will also be able to access all the weekly memos that you have missed. And what are weekly memos? Everybody learns differently. And each week we prepare for you notes, guidance notes in very simple language that will help you with your business. So we've talked about pivoting. We've talked about some financial statements. We have talked about how you operationalize your strategy. So there are so many different areas. It's a reservoir of information. So ensure that you are part of COVID cast going forward. Tonight, we are talking the business of education. Do you remember a time when education was for the few persons who were considered worthy, whether they had the money, whether they're of, of the class to receive education. And we have seen where over the years through history, through fighting for our people, we are at a place where education is available to all. But is it really available to everybody? And in this time of COVID and online learning, are we really experiencing an equitable distribution of education? Can everybody log in and access? What do we do in the going forward? Are we delivering education to our children in the best way possible? Are we empowering our teachers, training our teachers to be able to deliver in this new time of logging in where everything is online? Or are we still playing catch up? Are our children way ahead of us in this learning? Tonight, we are going to be talking to some experts. We have Dr. Renee Ratri, CEO of Teach Good, Lead Good. We have Gordon Swaby, CEO and founder of Edufocal Limited. And we have Jody Williams, owner of Building Blocks and Reach Academy. Let me just welcome some persons I see joining. Hi, Devian. Glad you are in. And I'm hoping I'm pronouncing Cavell Mackenzie properly. I hope I haven't butchered your name, Cavell. Sandra, you are present. So please, if you are viewing this alone and you haven't told a friend to stop what they're doing right now and join us live on COVID Cast JA, please go ahead and send them the link right now. Natalie Prendergast, I see you. You are in. So let's get right into the discussion. A lady that, uh, that may, in fact, not be a strange face to many, CEO of Teach Good, Lead Good, an educator, but an educator extraordinaire who is passionate about how we not only deliver education to our children, but how we excite them on this journey of learning. Dr. Renee Ratri has committed her time through Teach Good, Lead Good to ensure too that our teachers are equipped with the leadership training and the skills for this next generation of learning. Renee, how are you? I am wonderful. Hi, Rochelle, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So happy for you to be here. <laughs> Richard Stewart. Hi, Richard. Glad you are here. 
Rene, tell us before we get into into this um discussion of mm -hmm. pedagogy. We pronounce it right. You did, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a tick and a sticky, oh, <laughs> a sticky, a sticky. A sticky. <laughs> Really, tell us about Teach Good, Lead Good. What is your commitment behind Teach Good, Lead Good? And what is the why of your organization? Oh, my Lord. Okay, so Teach Good, Lead Good. It, it really is a movement. Um, I think we, we exist to shape a whole new narrative about the possibilities of education. So that, that pedagogy word is the pedagogy of possibility, I think, is what um, Teach Good, Lead Good is about to really show um, teachers and school leaders and the public in general, you know, what teaching and learning needs to be like at this time, you know, the innovation that's required. And um, so we, we do a lot of workshops with teachers, bespoke workshops in schools with school leaders, and also just partner with organizations, foundations that are doing innovative cutting edge work um, we run a, a, a project called Science Genius Jamaica, which merges dance hall with science. And um, we are connectors, I think. I, I try to connect um, people in education with people outside of the sector, in private sector and in community. Um, so that, because education is everybody's business, right? So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so Teach Good, Lead Good is, is that kind of work. It's mission, yeah, exactly. mission driven. <laughs> yes, for education being the business of everybody. Absolutely. So, Rene, I'm just thinking that at the start of Teach Good, Lead Good, the, the business, your business operations would have started ahead of the COVID pandemic. Yes, just before. Yes. And um, I do recall that one of the things you've said in the past is that we have to be prepared for a time when our students should be able to log in from anywhere, learn from anywhere, attend school from anywhere. Are you look prophetic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because now we're dealing with COVID. Yes. Now, in terms of how Teach Good, Lead Good has had to, to, to pivot its operations in this time, what kind of pivots have you had to do with with the information too that you are passing on to to to, to school leaders because a different platform altogether oh it's completely different you know most of my work was actually in schools interfacing with teachers getting into their hearts and heads and working alongside them and actually modeling um the way the way teaching should happen and um so now i mean once covid hit i was like oh but it created an opportunity for for me to engage a broader audience i think and so i i immediately got on um instagram started using all the social media channels to to engage teachers from all from all over all at the same time and i found that i had to so i, I was i was interviewing persons who were in the field, it was all new to everybody. So I started interviewing everybody, the parents, the teachers, some students, people who had started to do pockets of great things. Um, and, and so to showcase that, and, mm -hmm. and I had to ensure that my information was relevant and, and, and because of how th rapidly things were changing, I kept having to you know, connect people with persons who were doing things abroad and persons who are you know doing things in the ministry of education to communicate to to people you know what was happening and as the changes were evolving so okay. it actually was a really big shift for me for my for my business because um i that's not what you in mind that's not how you thought you were even going to be delivering no, your services absolutely not absolutely not and i mean what it has done too is that it's just broken there are no geographical boundaries right so i'm engaging with people all over the world and having them come in to share with teachers here in in jamaica and and pairing teachers from different schools with each other so and that's something that i would not have had an opportunity to do before because i would have been going into one school and, and sharing with the staff one at a time. So it really has allowed for a, a, a way bigger reach. A way bigger reach. And I know we are seeing our students um, going online. We've heard all of the, you know, some of the challenges that the, the teachers have had with 
you know, for, for themselves too, their own internet access, their access to the devices, their ability to manipulate and utilize these systems. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I, I, I also recall about Teach Good, Lead Good is that the leadership aspect of it, yes. that you have been training school leaders with, on leadership. But I want to go a little further. The business of education. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a duty as as teachers to to be providing a service is it a service and our students our clients is, should we be seeing how education the role that we are playing as teachers differently or is it just that we go in front of the classroom and we deliver is is is, is that um, evolving um rochelle i think that we have to relook at what education is about i don't think we can be satisfied with the way we've been doing it it's been outdated it's outdated really antiquated and and in some instances i just think bankrupt you know because it's not serving our clients because i believe they are in the ways that we that we need to we need a bigger vision for it mm -hmm. and i think that we have to we have to think beyond what we now have. So we didn't think that we could ever offer learning in the way that we're offering outside of walls. We, yeah. we have not considered that to be a possibility up until now. There are organizations like Gordon's Edifocal, and he'll speak to that, that have been pushing those buttons for some time and showing us how, how giving us glimpses of what that could look like. But I don't think on a broad scale we ever imagined mm -hmm. that we could be doing this. And um, and and so I think that it is such an exciting time for somebody to be an educator. I think there are many kinds of roles, many kinds of jobs in education that people can can begin to to get into. Designing curriculum, designing content, putting it in different form format. You know, we need learning designers in this education space. We need, you know, all kinds of individuals who are going to come. So you mentioned job creation and yeah. in, and job creation and education in the same sentence, not even in the mm -hmm. same paragraph, in the same sentence. And I mean, if we are to look at the history of our education, education would have started, especially in Jamaica, a lot of mm -hmm. church schools, right. like government institutions. But no, what you're saying is that there are opportunities outside of the walls of, of how we've seen education Absolutely. that um, as we are even showing our students what are the, the things that they can do in, in the future and the entrepreneurial um, opportunities. Right. What, what, what is that education? I mean, is a business not a business? Isn't it a service? You know, isn't it isn't it something that really is more from a, a, a charitable foundation? Oh, oh. See, business with job creation listen a school is one of the biggest enterprises ever with some of the largest constituents and as uh, having served as a principal myself i know what it is like to run that an enterprise <laughs> like that with many different parts that one has to move um and so it, it, education definitely it can be an income generating space that's what covid has pushed us to see there are those of us who have known this for a long time um i think when i was starting teach good lead i was like ah! but I, I have seen that there is there is so much scope for us to go beyond what it is that we're presently doing the private sector is one one i mean there's so many areas of partnership i think that have to happen in terms in order to get students to be their full selves and have mm -hmm. schools to function in what i call a learning ecosystem i i don't think it's a little a little you can't see schools just on their own because we're too siloed at the moment and i don't think any planning that happens in a school must happen without everybody at the table mm -hmm. business people people community people people who, who own the little shop or the supermarket in our community um because that's where students are going to do their internship that's where we're going, you know, we're partnering with the universities and the schools, the, the, the community colleges in our in our area, the medical facilities in order to really um, have a, a, a fulsome experience for our children because we're preparing them for a different kind of society. No, we're not preparing them for to just read and write and do some subjects. It's not, that's not the kind of world we're in. Um, and so we have to be, creating opportunities for them while they are growing and while they're learning to experience the world as it is, you know, as it really is. 
But this movement, this movement um, to a different way of how we see education and that we, we not just see it in, in just, just boxing it again mm -hmm. into the four walls of a classroom, but we're seeing that global impact of education. And we have to be talking about it now. We do. Yeah, yeah. but you know, some people say, but Renee, look at, uh, look at us. We did do some subject and so at school and we didn't go to And nothing not wrong with it. Nothing not wrong with it. I mean, are you now saying to that teachers need to even be understanding business that principals, the leaders in the school need to be understanding how to operate the, the school as a business? We can't just leave it to the bursa anymore. But of course, the, this, the, the, the principal is a CEO. The principal is a CEO. I mean, when I do some of my work, I take them to go sit in offices with CEOs who are in private sector so that they can have conversations and talk the language because that is what that's what we do. It is it is running a massive, massive enterprise, as I said. And so it is important for teachers to have knowledge of all to be generalists. If you're going to be effective, you have to know a little bit about everything. And you know, some of the best. The schools that have done the best job of pivoting during COVID are the ones who have the best leaders, the best administrators, the ones who organize themselves and who have been planning for mm -hmm. them for a while. So there are schools who knew we have to get tablets into the hands of our children so that they have, have access all the time. Or we have to send home a video with them so that they can watch the video while they're at home. So when we come to class, we're just having discussions. There are schools that have been doing those things um, in, in pockets, you know, schools that have been investing in their infrastructure, begging their alumni to, to support those kinds of ventures because they have seen the, what's going to happen. And so, and that comes down to leadership. That really comes down to leadership and seeing the big picture and having a big vision for what education should, should be like. So like, I just want to see all kind of enterprise and uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and industry going on in a school. That would be my idea. Like it's one thing in the day and it becomes, it evolves into something else in the night and the students and the parents and the community are involved in that, in the running of this, of this learning ecosystem that we have. And you keep mentioning the ecosystem that there are all of these adjoining parts in yeah. any community. And I'm, I see Sydney McCain says, good evening all. Teachers need to be better equipped with laptops and paid software the yep. real tools in order to do an excellent job of this. The workspace needs to evolve to accommodate this movement of education. And Sidoni, you see here Sidoni talking about Sidon, Sidona talking uh -huh. about this movement. Now, in, in the ecosystem that we currently have, because we still have to examine the ecosystem, yeah. the, does the ecosystem that we have, um, is it set up to foster this this new way of, of envisioning education? Sadly, sadly, no. I think that we are, we have a prescribed cur curriculum. We have ways of assess, assessing our young people and ways of teaching. And, and those are expectations, right? Um, and only, only the brave there to, to do things differently. Um, but I think that we have to examine and we have to advocate for it to be done in a different way. Um, I, because we can't continue. I, what I've seen so far with assessments is very different from what we have been accustomed to do. I'm, I'm getting, you know, principals and teachers sharing um, videos with me about what their students are doing outside and how they're going out and exploring more and how they're, you know, bringing in, bringing in things from around them to inform the teaching. And we didn't used to do it in that way. We, 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 and we still are set up to, um, you know, pass an exam to only do what 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 is required. And and it, it, I don't think that that is that is going. It, I know for certain that that's not going to serve us in in, in the in the next little while. And COVID has come to push us ahead. And and to be so there's been an opportunity created through COVID for Absolutely. us to be forced to rethink. And and, in and I agree with Sidonna. I agree with Sidonna. We do not have the kind of tools and support that teachers need. Teachers should not have to um, 
you know, be, be trying to scrounge in order to do what they need to do in, 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 in an online space or in the classroom. And we have to get more resources that are going to be able to equip them to do their jobs well and provide them with training because there's so many willing teachers. There's exactly. so many teachers who want to learn. It's been new and the learning curve has been, has been really um, steep for some, but I think so many of them are anxious to try things differently, you know? Yeah, just because I'm seeing Dan Edwards says, how is, and please get those comments in. I'm really enjoying these comments. And we have Dr. Renee Ratri, CEO of Teach Good, Lead Good. So we have an expert here and we, we are having a conversation. So we want you to be a part of the conversation. Dan Edwards says, how is the Education Commission going to revolutionize education and train the soft skills we need in the workplace? Hi, Diane. Hi, Diane. Um, well, I I don't, the Education Commission isn't really set up to revolutionize education. The Education Commission was set up to do an overview of what we have and to, you know, have conversations with persons within the space to and make recommendations as to as to the way forward. So that's really the whole point of the commission. But I think that going forward, we will have to we will have to bring everybody to the table to have conversations about how we want to do things and you know better. as we talk about revolutionizing our next guest is actually gordon swaby mm -hmm. and what we uh, what we will see i think in the trends going forward is that we will see more entrepreneurs more entrepreneurs. Adapt, and rather than waiting on government that they know find ways of filling those gaps definitely um, there's a, a micro schools are something you know garden garden has emerged um evolved into an academy um from an online platform and there are other micro schools that are being set up pods that are being set up mm -hmm. in in people's homes with small groups of students offering specialized kinds of um services like stem or stem and the arts and i think that we are going to see more of that with people who are looking for smaller spaces for um, more individualized attention, for self-paced learning. We're going to see a lot of that in the in the future. And even people being taught by people who don't even live don't anywhere even near there. And Sandra Palmer says, my concern is that a number of teachers are not technologically savvy. There should be allowance given for consistent training in this area. Great point, Absolutely. Sandra. This is the way of the world now, and we must get up to speed quickly. Absolutely. Um, Wait, let me say Melolicious, I hope I pronounce that correct. Um, agrees with Sidonna. I definitely agree with you. School leadership should do their environmental scanning and have a growth mindset. Or schools should be poised towards taking school operations online. So we have Sandra saying that we have to have the continuous learning continuous. in technology too. Um, mm -hmm. Melolicious is also now saying that we have to be doing that broader scale thinking and having a growth mindset yeah. so we are poised for these new school operations what are your thoughts no yeah i think that we the training is something that has to be ongoing i we do not provide our teachers with enough training and the truth is rochelle teachers have to go find some of the training themselves because um that's one of the things i encourage teachers to do we can't sit back and wait on that to be given to us but you have to find your you know ways of developing yourself um going forward because there's there are lots of short courses out there lots of free courses out there as well where you know teachers can access and 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 get online unesco right now is offering a really great course in online learning starting in october it's something that people should go and check out about teaching teachers how to learn online and they're they were having a hard time getting people to to um to, to log on and to commit to doing it and they're partnering with blackboard um that company in 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 the state so it's you know those are the kinds of things that I think have to be yeah. ongoing so our teachers also have a personal responsibility for their own continuous learning and development mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Debian says we have to model a country who is ahead of the game instead of starting from scratch it wastes time to reinvent the wheel O'Neill thank you for that Debbie O'Neill says a simple way for teachers if all the so-called equipment is not available is just using a textbook. A short voice note via WhatsApp could be used as a summary of important concepts they want pupils to get. 
Yes. Very interesting point, O'Neill. That's right. And you know, right now we don't have any excuses because we have this little thing here, <laughs> which everybody has. And um, you know, teachers can make make quick videos, share a voice note, share. I mean, I know the bandwidth is terrible, but hopefully we will we will sort those issues out soon as a country. Um, but there 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 are, there's so much information. There's so so many places that we can go now, all over YouTube, all over the internet, to find um, tools that can be brought into our classrooms and brought into our lessons. You know, so. Yeah. We don't have we don't have any excuses. excuses and you know ladies and gentlemen we are here talking to dr renee raptry ceo of teach good be good and again if you are saying to yourself how did i miss the first part of this conversation you can go on to smallbusinessportal.com you it will be the, the episode is going to be on our youtube page it's on our face facebook page and this is an episode that you do need to watch um renee as you are wrapping up you know, we talk about the new normal, no normal, and okay, we're going back face to face. We need to go back face to face. In going back face to face, can we go back to where we were or have things changed forever? Oh, I pray God we don't go back to where we were. <laughs> and yes, absolutely, things have changed forever. Um, and I think that we need to look at what has served us and and still maintain the things that that serve us i think social interaction is something that we cannot live without i think our children need it they crave it and school is more is not only about academics and and you know passing exams and all of that school is really a place to nurture and to shape you and to collaborate and learn about community and connection and responsibility and kindness and and so you know i think that we have to we, that will never go. And the teacher, and a, a, as facilitator, the teacher in the role as facilitator, and not one who is just pouring things down into into a child's brain, is is what needs to remain. It, the, the way the teacher approaches learning has to change, and the way the school, um, the, the way the school connects with its parents and communicates with its community, and 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 that all the people around it is is what we need to we need to change we need to address um going forward wow. if we're going to be successful so that's what i think um has 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 changed for us rush but i think that there's so much hope you know there's so much hope in 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 the future for education and for our young people if we really commit to thinking in a in a, in a bigger way for them because they already know what they want you know yeah, but we have to think in a bigger way. Thank you so much, Renee. Dr. Renee Ratri, CEO of Teach Good, Lead Good. I'm seeing the comments. Alana Wallen says, courses as well as our people resources, learning from each other is so important. Mm -hmm. Sidana says, these courses are great and are appreciated by the teachers. However, persons must understand that preparation time for classes have tripled and quadrupled. And so once the term starts, time for self-training becomes very limited. How yeah. can that be addressed? So before we go, Rene, let's just even take that question and let me just um, acknowledge the other comments. Melolisha says, I'm full joying online learning. It taps into my students. Wow. As well as my own creativity, critical thinking and collaboration. Teamwork saved me in the online space in team teaching or teachers partnering. So we're seeing, wow, Sandra says things will never go back to where it was and the pandemic has pushed us to move forward with technology. So we must adapt and learn. Yeah. There are physical education can now involve parents doing outside hours with kids. It can it's become true. a strong part. Diane yeah. says we need an education system that takes a more holistic view of developing the person, mm -hmm. not just the brain, also learning by doing to engage our boys. Diane, thank you for that comment. Uh, yeah. So um, in just blending Diane's comment in that holistic view of developing the person, but the also looking from the side of the persons that are charged with the education, with delivering the teachers, no also saying, but me hear about the courses. Well, I'm I have no time. 
Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I hear that. Where, could, where do teachers get the time to do this? I hear that. I'm, I, I feel like I'm working harder than, than ever before. But I, what I feel is that we have to find ways to work smarter and not harder. And in many instances, our, our, the very children in front of us, you know, can help us with that. Um, they, they, especially those high school students, some of those old, they, they know what they, how they want to learn. JC, I just did some work with Jamaica College the other day, and they had a hackathon where they designed courses alongside their teachers and designed it in the way they wanted to, to be taught. Now, I think that we have to tap into that. We have to tap into our colleagues. We have to collaborate more than we've ever done before and not just with teachers in our classroom, but with teachers from other schools and in other places. So, I, I, you know, we have to find ways to... So the possibility also lies in the partnership and yeah. seeing our students as our partners too. Yes, yes, yes. That We can work alongside them, looking for the best in class for the teachers, whether here or abroad, and really tapping into that partnership. Of yeah, we can get parents to come in and teach a class too, because they may have one hour that they can actually go online rather than drive to the school to do it um you know it affords us that too. specialty area wow yeah. thank you so much renee dr renee yeah, Rapp, is CEO. you know renee this conversation has been so good every time we're wrapping up we jump again thank you so much for joining us on covid cast ja thank you a senior here on you says teachers need to come together break down the curriculum per week and then each teacher can take a week or thus cutting down the prep time. Thank you very much for that point. Because what we're seeing now is that we have um, expanded this discussion of education in the partnerships, how we work together to move this system forward. And we're now gonna be joined by Gordon Swaby, CEO and founder of Edufocal Limited. And we've been hearing a lot about Edufocal. We've been hearing about an IPO. We have seen Edufocal in the marketplace way before online was cool, way before online was cool. Um, the work of Edufocal was already preparing our system for where we are where we are now. Gordon Swaby, welcome to COVID Cast. Thank you for joining us. Rochelle, thank Rochelle. you for having me. Uh, and I mean I, it was such a joy listening to, to Renee and you know her her energy, you know, or you know, the energy of the, the, the you know the conversation is just infectious. So um, you know, looking forward to our conversation and what we'll discuss so about the future of education. Yeah, because Gordon, you know, um, I'm, I'm actually thinking about when I heard about Edufocal first, and I'm seeing this young entrepreneur, you know, bright guy, why education and why this space that nobody even understand. But you were way before this time. Talk so a little bit about that Edufocal journey. So, uh, I started Edifocal along with my co-founder, Paul Allen, when I was, well, the company was registered November 19, 2010. Um, that was, I think, well, it was a day after my 20th birthday. Um, so it's been, it's been a decade, actually. Um, the first five years was spent with me having no idea. Um, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, you know, I was mostly winging it. Um, and I've never had a job outside of Eddie Fuka. This has been my only job. Um, so, so, you know, I've spent a lot of time figuring things out, understanding this space. Um, you know, I think that the title of, of, of today's um, COVID cast is appropriate, which is the business of education. Um, because, you know, as Renee said, it is absolutely a business, right? Um, and there's no shame in that. Um, you need money to grow, right? Um, and, and wherever it is going to come from, you actually need it to grow. So, um, we, we are happy to, um, you know, have been around before it became cool, as you rightly said. Uh, I think that we are well positioned now to take advantage of the opportunities, the change, you know, you know, the changes that are happening in this space. And it's just an exciting time. So, so yes, there's a lot of, you know, doom and despair. Um, but remember that there's life after all of this, you know, there's, yeah, I think you'll have to change the name of this soon from COVID cast to, to, yes. to something else. <laughs> because that's where, that's where we're going now to what is the next level thinking. Yeah, yeah, man, definitely. Edufocal would have, would have started offering online learning when um, it was still just very conceptual. What, mm -hmm. can you tell us about the, some of the services that your business currently offers and, and where are you going? So, so, 
we can break our offerings in three main categories. So we have what we call Edufocal Alpha, which is our original offering. We, um, it's just test prep content, supplementary material to help students, um, you know, to prepare for their exams. You know, so before PEP, it was called GSAT. And before GSAT, it was called um, Common Entrance. I don't know what it was called before <laughs> Common Entrance, right? Um, but, but you know, for a very long time, students have had to find past papers and prepare for their exams, and it was stressful. What we brought to the table in 2012 was this concept called gamification. And gamification is essentially taking elements from video games and incorporating it in learning. So it's still test prep, still students you know, on their phone, tablet, or laptop computers preparing for their exam. But while they were preparing for the exam, they could win prizes, they could win points, they could level up. You know, there was a leaderboard where they're competing against their friends. In fact, every year, right up, up until 2020, when COVID came along, we used to have this very big event at the Jamaica Pegasus called the Edufocal Excellence Awards, where hundreds of students across the island would come and they would, they, you know, they'd win money, you know, so we would give away, I think, up to 50,000 Jamaican dollars cash to that student and we'd help to fund their education both at the high school um both um yeah both we do have fun education um for students who are entering college so students who were leaving high school into college they'd get a, a cash bursary from us but also students who were leaving primary or prep school and going into high school the other offering that we have now um so that was our original offering the other offering that we have now is what we call edifocal plus um which is us offering live classes every single day and hour each day mondays to saturdays um mm -hmm. And that started last year, actually. And then our last offering is called Edufocal Academy, which is a full-time online school. Um, you know, really groundbreaking stuff where students can actually go to our school full-time online. Um, and, you know, last, we started that in 2020. And last year, we had 12 students at the, um, you know, the grade six level that took the PEP exam. And they all passed for their first choice school. Um, and they were with us, you know, they were with our school for almost a year. Um, so that's one side of the business. Because you, you, you hold me there. So I, I get, you know, past papers and stuff online. I thought that was just amazing that you could have this one spot and, and in a way that students would even want to be interested in being a part of it. And yes, I get the one hour classes, but now we have an online academy. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the thinking behind that? Do we think that a business of an online academy has legs to actually grow and potential to be some of the new look of the future? So I'll, I'll ask you, you know, there's a saying, I said that Jamaicans love to answer question in question. So I'll ask you a question. What is a school? <laughs> what is a school? A school is anywhere that you get in learning, don't you? So That's right. Home being home and learning from your grandparents is school mm -hmm. going to the physical school is school it's school learning online is school so so you know there's a lot there's a common refrain that we've heard since the start of this pandemic oh my god you know you know your parents saying oh my god we don't like online learning but you know why they don't really like online learning because they have to monitor their their, their child at home right um or at least i'd say that i mean obviously pandemic aside and the stress yeah. and stresses of it but Really, you know, having a full-time job and trying to monitor your child in online school is tough. But if, if you think about it, we all are learning online, right? As adults using the internet every day, we all are learning something. Whether it is superficial and not really deep knowledge, we are all learning, right? It may not be in a formal way, but it is learning. So I think that at the pace that the world... So I, I, I have a thing. I feel like we're moving from the age... You remember when people talk about the age of information? I feel like we're shifting away now from the age of information to the age of curation because there's so much knowledge out there but a lot of people don't know how to, to you know to make you know to, to understand what it is that they are receiving so people need trusted sources of information uh, or trusted sources that they can receive this information and, and, and again yeah, that's why you had the whole phenomenon of fake news and so on and so forth that's still education and learning you know right so people want quality information because learning is information aside from the need to socialize which by the way i'm a big i'm, I'm a big proponent of i believe in this blended idea this, this idea of blended learning so all learning does not have to be online it can be done in a mixed way and again we're pretty excited about some of the things that we'll be doing 
when we're able to meet in person again. Um, and I think that my mindset is instead of complaining about the, the you know the the, the the potential consequences we face of students not being in school for two years, um, which I completely disagree with. There's a lot of students who've not who've not gotten any contact time, but there are many students who have flourished in this particular period, and we we have the numbers, we have the testimonials, uh, so we can speak to it. And of course, you know, we we're not able at this point in time to to to, to impact hundreds of thousands of students you know, in a beneficial way, but we're breaking it off one small piece at a time with the goal and the aim to scale what it is that we're doing. So we have we have Gordon Swaber, who is CEO and co-founder of Educofocal Limited. We are talking about the business of education and Educofocal is in the business of But By the way, Rochelle, by the way, Rochelle, I, I, I'm told that Educofocal Academy pays very well. Apparently we pay our teachers very well. Um, so you know and, and there's a reason that we can pay our teachers well right um we have structured our operations in such a way that we want to attract the, the best talent right so if you're a teacher you're looking to change you know your place of employment you want to you know you want that you know change of pace please apply to any focal right um because we're always looking for talent. Job creation right away job creation absolutely. right away. absolutely absolutely we have we have almost 50 full-time employees um, but Jordan, I'm still I'm I'm wrapping my mind around online and online academy, and I know our viewers are saying, how does an online academy work? Especially some of the parents who cannot wait for the children to get out of the house. Please go leave, go to school. How does an online academy operate? How do you do things like netball and football? How does what happens with, with with those other areas joining clubs, the extracurricular activities? How does an online academy operate? So that's a great question, Rochelle. And and again, unfortunately, we've not been able to do so. And I say we, I mean generally speaking, not just any focal. With our school, we've not been able to um, engage in a lot of the physical activities that we would want to do. And I don't want to kind of give away too much but i would say that we have a lot of interesting things planned and we're going to solve that problem um you know everybody wants to go to campion everybody wants to go to kc to jc to st hilda's to you know immaculate all of these great schools but immaculate and and, and campion and all of these great schools have had a hard time scaling their operations how do you duplicate the greatness that you have at a pace to keep up with the demand and I feel like we've cracked that code. I feel like we're about to unleash it. And I'm very, very excited about that. So, so no, we've not been able to have, you know, the physical activities, but that's not because we've not found a solution for it. It's just that because of, you know, because of the, the pandemic and, and our inability to do certain activities, um, it has not been possible. Um, but we do do virtual school, um, virtual zoo tours, for example. There are a number of interesting things that we've done and we'll continue to do um, as things improve, um, you know, from 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 the, the perspective of the pandemic, yeah. and we've we've heard um, news reports of a potential IPO, and I mean, without giving out, you know, I mean, persons are maybe saying to themselves, you know, we know about you know consumer goods and stuff, and and some of these other areas that and financial institutions with the IPO, but but an education institution, how can they be? How can that even come up? <clears throat> So I can't speak to whether an IPO is happening or not, um, but I would say that again, you know, education for me, you know, it, it has a lot of legs. We, we don't want to get too technical, but when you think about, you know, things like artificial intelligence, uh, cryptocurrency, you know, augmented reality, there's so many things that we need to learn. Um, People are looking for solutions. And again, just going back to my point about um, curating high quality information for people to consume. People are willing to pay for high quality information. So, so you know, the other side of our business too, actually, is, is, is called this. So we have two divisions, Educocal Learn, which is what I just described, and Educocal Business. Mm -hmm. Educocal Business actually focuses on creating learning content for organizations, right? Don't want to name a lot of our clients, but we have very big clients that we work with. And we create learning material for organizations for them to use with their staff. That is still education, right? So, you know, it's just that when we think about education, I, I believe that, you know, we, you know, being most people, they think about it a very, oh, it's a child going to school every single day. 
sitting in a class. That's not just education, right? There are, so there are many facets to what education is. And again, I, you know, I feel like with what we have planned, people can, you know, people start to see that, you know, there's more scope and more legs to, you know, to what is possible. And and yes, if, if a company like ours was to list, I'm pretty sure it'd be very attractive um, to a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and, and again, a way of us thinking bigger than the walls of a school. Mm -hmm. because, because life has expanded beyond walls now. Absolutely. And, and we're even thinking about things like remote education and curating the information so it's not just about putting it in a textbook but curating this wide body of information that's easily accessible mm -hmm. when as you look from a business perspective and you are looking to see you know what what do you anticipate will be the the the, the, the look and feel of school in and i asked renee in a different way um earlier when we go back to students being able to go back into school, how do you think we will be operating? Can we go back or are we are we going to have some parents who say, but this online is working for me. Why don't I go to an edgy phone call? Is it that things have changed so dramatically for us? I hope so. I, I, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So when I was in high school, you know, I used to, you know, it's a lot of girls that I had crushes on, um, you know, but I was so shy. But anyway, you know, we'd be in math class or, or, or you know, or, or language class. And, you know, there was something that I didn't understand. Um, and, you know, you'd expect me to put up my hand or raise my hand in class, you know, so that the teacher can know that I'm not understanding it. But I was, I was embarrassed. I didn't want the girl that I liked to know that um, I didn't understand this particular um, concept. You know, no, of course not. I don't want her to know that. So I'd sit at the back of the class because, you know, I wanted to be at the back of the class because... And that's where you could, you know, be up to your antics. Um, and I ended up losing out on the value that I could have um, received from raising my hand. Um, you know, girl, be damned. And you know, so 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 that was an issue. So I should have to say that I feel like the the future of education um, is centered a lot around personalized learning, mm -hmm. right? And what I mean by that is John Brown who goes to a particular school who is in grade five or grade six should be able to get quality learning that is catered to him or her, right? Um, and that is impossible without technology. You can't have a class of 50 or 60 students, right? And offer curated, customized um, learning to them without leveraging technology. So there is no future for education in Jamaica or anywhere else on earth without leveraging and using technology. And not just using it in a superficial way because you can get your kids tablets, right? You can get them laptops, but the tablets and the laptops alone will not solve our problems, right? Because you can place these tablets, these electronic devices in situations and it actually ends up doing more harm than good, right? So you, you can't think about, you know, growing and, and changing the face of education in a very superficial PR friendly way. You know, you have to get to the root of it and understand how can we help, help, help our kids? How can we help kids that can't read um, and we're handing tablets, you know, or laptops to them? You know, you, so we have to, there are a lot of things that we need, fundamental issues that we need to solve. And again, I see these things as opportunities. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty excited about, 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 you know, solving these problems um, that which will ultimately redound to the benefit of Jamaica and Jamaicans. So definitely. And you know, I'm, I'm seeing a comment here from Natalie Prendergrass and I see Beverly and I also see your comment. So Alana Wallen says, hey Alana, we're shifting now from the age of information to the age of curation because she's reiterating that powerful statement. Natalie says, well, my child has missed out a lot from last year. And secondly, I don't have internet at home. And thirdly, he does not have a tablet or a phone. It has not been easy for my son as, um, as fall back because he has fallen back because of COVID. Um, there is a reality though of access. That, Absolutely. Um, in, in moving the business of education forward, are we also leaving a big portion of our people behind? So when I, took, when I, when I said to you earlier, Rochelle, that we solved the problem, um, I'm, I'm serious, right? And equality and equity is important to me, right? Um, 
and you can't talk about the future of education and learning without talking about you know access to, to tablets and the lab so so the point i was making earlier is that obviously we're not it's not we're not giving them these devices certainly they need the internet certainly they need the devices you know when you look at a country like nigeria and, and we're blessed to not have these problems so we have elect, um, ele um, expensive electrical um, electricity costs in Jamaica, right? Some of the highest on earth. You know, I've been to Nigeria, and one of the first experiences I had in Nigeria was me sitting in a restaurant, and the power went. Now I'm shocked about the power going, but everybody is just, oh, this is an everyday thing. Nigeria, you know, one of the largest oil-producing nations on earth, regularly loses electricity. So in addition to having poor internet connectivity, no tablets. They also have um, lack of access to, to, to electricity. So even charging their devices is a problem, right? So I'm saying that there are many barriers that we have, and again, we're fortunate to ha not have those issues or not to have that particular issue. Um, but I have figured out, my team and I have figured out a way around this tablet issue, this um, internet issue, um, and again, I'm looking forward to rolling out that solution in the very, very near future. Maybe you'll have me on COVID cast again very soon to talk about it. Definitely. And, but I'm pretty excited. I think it's groundbreaking and I'm looking forward to rolling it out because I've been thinking about this issue you know, for almost two years. And I, you know, I can't remember her name right now. I think it was Debbie. You know, we want to help to solve, you know, the problem, you know, the problem that someone like Debbie has, you know, with her child. Oh, that's um, Natalie. Natalie, rather. Sorry, Natalie. You know, helping to solve some of the problems that she's having with her child and you know him or her having access to the internet and the device to help so you know for sure that's something that we're excited about so the business of education now we're seeing the opportunities of, of solving problems not just setting up a classroom but solving problems Absolutely. and Beverly, um before i get to vanessa's question so we're going to take vanessa's question Beverly says, why are high schools not using the facilities outside of school time to educate adults in their community with evening classes online or face-to-face -face when this pandemic has dissolved? That's a great point, Beverly. And Vanessa asks, what about the development of executive functioning? How is this done online? How do your teachers support students in the social, emotional areas? So we have an online academy um, are you still, are teachers still able to connect in the way that they would do face-to-face? -face? So we don't just focus on, um, you know, academics at Eddy Football Academy. We actually have something called Clubhouse. And Clubhouse is a period or a time for students to engage with uh, professionals. So we'll invite speakers to talk about, you know, like DJing, you know, you know, just life of an, you know, life in an unconventional job or we'll invite mental health experts to talk about mental health because there's no way we can be going through what we're going through now, this tough period and not be talking about mental health. It's extremely important. So we do again, do our best to facilitate um, things that are not traditionally in, you know, in, in, in the, the NSC, the national standards curriculum um, or the typical school curriculum. Um, and, and, and the response to that has been amazing. In fact, maybe it's something that we should break out and have as its own offering, not only to students, but to other people. Wow. And I'm seeing um, Melolicious, so as we are wrapping up with Gordon, Melolicious says, I am anxious to hear about this innovation. I can't wait for this. <laughs> baby. So we're looking forward to having Gordon back on the program when this new innovation is rolled out. And Gordon, as we are wrapping up, what um, what words would you leave with our audience about the business of education? The only thing constant in life is change. Um, and I think that, the, you know, our best days are, bit, our best days are ahead of us. Um, so while this period is tough, um, I think that we will emerge from this as a country, um, better not only in education, but in all the other spheres of, um, of, of Jamaica land we love. Thank you very much. Gordon Swaby, CEO, co-founder of Edufocal Limited. And before we wrap up, where do we find you? So, I mean, you can find me personally on twitter.com. So twitter.com slash Gordon Swaby. Um, I'm on Instagram, instagram.com slash Gordon Swaby. And in terms of Edufocal, you can find us at www.edufocal.com. Um, and that is also true for Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So slash Edufocal on all the social media platforms. Thank you so much. Gordon Swaby, co-founder of Edufocal Limited. So we have heard from 
Dr. Renee Ratri, who talked to us about the pedagogy of, of learning and teaching our teachers in a different way, opening our teachers' minds to a more creative way of how they deliver, how they lead, how they continue to learn, how we partner in the delivery of education. We're hearing from Gordon Swaby, who as an entrepreneur has seen the potential and the opportunity in education and his organization offers online and online academy. Um, his organization is also a curator of information, of learning information. So now we're going to talk to what would be more a traditional learning ed, um, facility. And we are going to be joined by Jody Williams, who is the owner of Building Blocks and Reach Academy. And she's going to be talking to us about the experience of a traditional, a more traditional learning setup of four walls that has had to pivot to online and where she sees things going. Thank you so much, Jody, for joining us. You know, Jody, because you are a teacher, you know, when you're talking to teacher, you always want to say, Mrs. Williams, can, thank you very much for joining us. Can I call you Jody? <laughs> Jody, they don't call me Jody, you know, they call me Auntie Jody because I'm cool. So, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Jody. Now, um, Building Blocks and Reach Academy, just before we get into discussion, can you just tell us a little bit about both of, of these education facilities? Sure. So, Building Blocks is actually a preschool, so we take kids from 18 months to four years, so they're little. And Reach Academy is a prep school, so we take children from four years to grade six, and then they would graduate and move on to high school. And we, um, continue, you're saying something else? Oh, I was just going to tell you that Reach has been open now for 10 years, and Billing Blocks has been open for 20 years. It Stop. was previous. <laughs> <laughs> A long time. <laughs> long time. And I mean, over the years, so you would have started with building blocks, um, yes. seeing the opportunity to expand into Reach Academy, the, the next level of learning. Um, both, both, and I, I like to call them organizations, set up, operational, COVID hits, and everything goes helter-skelter. Did it go helter-skelter for your business? How, how was that recovery time? for Building Blocks and, and Reach Academy? Okay, so Building Blocks, um, it's there, like I said, it's small. So they're 18 months to four years. So we did offer online school Zoom. Um, we did videos, uh, Google Classroom, and Zoom circle time Monday to Thursday, and then delivered packages on Friday for the following week. But I did not find that there was a big uptake in Zoom classes for that age group because the kids are little. They do have to be monitored. You have to sit with them. The activities, what we did was we sent three activities per day, like what we would do at school. So you'd only be missing like the playground, the actual physical building. Mm -hmm. um, but it's difficult for parents to have to do those activities with the children, even though we sent a video to go along with it. So we'd actually show you how to do the artwork with the children and that was uploaded to google classroom for reach we took when we heard about covid we heard the thursday that we're going to have to close the friday we closed the friday we didn't have school on friday and we we brought our teachers in we did some training we actually had to pay for zoom because we needed the security of not being able to be hacked or people to come into your Zoom classroom because we wanted a safe space. Those children are still young, four years to 12 years. And we had to get all the books that we had online also. So we use a program, we use a set of books and we what we did was we put those books, we got the online edition for those books. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of back work to do in a short space of time to get ready for the Monday. Yeah. And I know it's important for us to remember that that our schools have had to do some of the biggest pivoting. Um, and Cavell, I see your comment. Kamisha will soon get to your comment too. No, but you are the owner and principal of a school. And, you know, as, as a private institution, both private institutions, right. you know, people always ask, you know, do, do, how do you, how does a school earn revenue? And, 
I mean, do you have, are, are there fixed costs? Because parents are asking, if, if we're learning online, why we even have to pay school fee? So there are fixed costs. And, you know, what I like to ask parents, I like to ask people in on hold. So now when you go to the doctor, you can go to the doctor online, correct? Correct. But it's the same cost. Yes. <laughs> because you're getting a service. So if you're learning all the things from grade one, just because you're not in the building, does it mean it should cost less to you? Because it is a service that's being offered. Right. So I, my question now would be to the whoever is asking, how come you accept it from the doctor to have to pay the same cost online, but you don't accept it from the teacher? And, and, and do you find, too, that, you know, as these questions have come up, especially during COVID with online learning, that you've had to have that discussion more about the service, that this is a service or the students are your clients, the parents are your clients. And notwithstanding COVID, you still have to be maintaining a high level of service to maintain your client base. Yes, and I still have to train all my teachers. We trained them from before, and now we're adding additional training for all the online programs that we also offer and that we have incorporated. Um, luckily for us, we were able to go back in person because we are a smaller school before other schools, but that also meant teaching simultaneously online and in person for my teachers. <laughs> and I, I think sometimes we don't have that conversation and we don't recognize too that even in delivering both online and face-to-face -face in that same setting and time, that that is a whole other level of training too for our teachers and systems to be set up. Yes, I had to hardwire my entire school so that every laptop could just be plugged directly into, had the internet just directly into the um, computer so that they were not glitches when the teachers were delivering the information to the students. So there was a lot of, infrastructure that had to be put in so that we could still offer face-to-face -face for the students that wanted face-to-face -face and online learning for the students that the parents that wanted online learning and then if you needed to be online for whatever reason or when the government said okay absolutely no in-person school we're all online it also worked better for my teachers to be at school some of the times because their internet at home was not as good as the one at school so there are all of those things that you have to take into consideration. And parents are lovely and they are very considerate. But at times, you know, they are frustrated if the teacher's internet is not delivering what they need at that time, if their child is not learning or is not getting the information. Yes. And, you know, both of your institutions, Building Blocks and Reach Academy, have always been innovative in the way that you deliver education and, and just very forward thinking. But I'm sure even in your forward thinking, you didn't have COVID, a COVID kind of setup in mind. Um, how have you had to innovate differently as a business to ensure that you're still able to deliver a high level of service? Uh, yeah. It was um, very challenging, as you can imagine. We did have to wheel and come again because with COVID, for me, the biggest change, I think, was that the teachers had to do both online and in person at a time. I think it's easier to do one or the other, not simultaneous having to teach in person and online. And so it was about creating the best timetable that could work for them to do that because for each age group, it's different. So what works for kindergarten once a four-year-old is not going to work for grade six or may not be best for the grade six children. Oh, and, and even in, in communication, because communication with, with parents who are your customers has changed dramatically over time. Because I remember just a few years ago, it's not way back when, just a few years ago when I would have been going to say prep school, the main form of communication, you probably get a little letter in your bag to say we're going to the zoo tomorrow, or you would have, you know, PTA meetings. But no, there is the WhatsApp, there are no Zoom meetings. And so how have you had to engage parents so that they can be on this journey, this innovation journey as things change during COVID? So we do have a lot of Zoom meetings with the parents. We have um, WhatsApp groups with the classes have WhatsApp groups. We have parent reps that give the information to the parents that we have a WhatsApp group with. We've had 
um, online assemblies, so assemblies that are taped so that the parents can be involved with it still. Because remember, there are things that parents were accustomed to being a part of in the school day, and now you can't be because of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. We send a lot of emails, so we're very big on emails. We never really did the letters at home. Uh, so we've always sent emails to the parents, constant communication. The teachers have their own email address so that parents can talk directly to the teacher or email the teacher directly rather than having to go through the office and then to the teacher. And I right. see Vanessa, um, Vanessa Corey Salas are saying for Reach Academy, we had to be willing to let go of what was and move towards what is best for now. Being future focused, you have to be flexible in your thinking. And that's some that's 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 some different kind of talking now because we're talking um earlier we had in the comments a growth mindset for our teachers, a growth mindset in our schools, and we're now talking about future focus. You know, as as in this business of education, I mean, to be future focused, especially with curfew and lockdown, how do you still maintain that mindset that sit that sees what's gonna happen in, in next year? How are you gonna continue growing this organization? Well, with the curfew and um, all the limitations that we have had, we have also partnered with some school with um, some programs away to allow for our teachers to have future focused mindset and be able to grow in their profession also so i mean so you can so you 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 partner with other providers who are also able to help you with this future focus thinking yes, and, I mean, education we're talking about and we're doing things like pep and stuff so some of the parents i say we're talking about future focus we just need to deal with it right now how do you get that that energy for parents to also be buying into this vision you have to sell it to them from the beginning you have to get them excited when they come and they see your school and they speak to the teachers and they have an idea of what the long-term vision is you find that they i find that they buy into it so they're they are ready for future focus a lot of parents are looking for the future they just want to be guided in that direction yes and, and we've heard about all of the challenges of covid have you had any significant learnings or just seeing just things differently, these opportunities that have come out for the business of education um, through COVID? Uh, through COVID, we've had, we've had a few opportunities. Um, we have partnered with a lot of schools. What I've found is that COVID has brought us closer together as school leaders. So we talk a lot more with other schools, mm -hmm. um, give them advice on what we're doing here, what they're doing. Uh, so I think it has brought the community closer together, which yes. is which is also a very good thing. Because we were talking about partnerships before. Yes. But um, can you tell us, Reach Academy and Building Blocks, when a parent is watching now and saying to themselves, why Reach Academy? Why, why would I choose a Reach Academy? And why would I choose a Reach Academy now um, in these times? Why Reach? Why Reach? Reach offers... Um, can reach is open to offering everything that you need for me I mean I heard Gordon speak about online learning and online learning can be very great technology is excellent but I do believe it is very important that children do socialize they're in the classroom they have the hands-on learning so for me that's what I think reach offers it offers it offers everything to all the learners so everybody can get what they need not everyone can learn online unfortunately yeah. so so that blend and um as you are as you know we're talking about um more vaccinations more vaccinations <laughs> so that we can get back to some level of, of of normalcy and and our children can go back into school do you think and i've asked all the guests this can we go back to what we considered normal or has normal changed for us forever uh, normal has changed for us forever. However, I hope it has made us more flexible in our thinking. I do think that before this, education was kind of put in a box and that we were not able to come out of the box. So in prep school, our goal was to get to do PEP or primary school, to do PEP and to go to a good high school. So the children were not able to weave and find out what works best for them. They were just working towards the exam. 
I would hope that now a, a lot of parents have spent time with their children. They've seen what type of learners their children are, what really works for them, what doesn't work for them, so that they will also be in charge of what works best for their children. They can say to the teacher, boy, you know, this is this type of learning or this situation doesn't work best for my child. Yes. And I see um, Narda Ventura. Hi, Narda says socializing. Super Hi, Narda. important. Cavell McKenzie says face-to-face -face interaction is so very crucial, especially for the younger children. Learning through fun and play is very limited online. Reading, which is so very important, is more difficult to do online when it comes to grouping. The love you give to kids in person is also not the same online. So we're seeing all different views with online. And Kamisha um, said an earlier question from Vanessa was, was excellent. One of the other things Gordon could have added is that at Edifocal Academy to support development of executive functions, students have individual projects which they can present in a variety of ways. So, you know, when you're seeing all of the commentary online versus face-to-face -face and that things will never really ever go back to the way that it, that it, it was, when you look back now at, at what got you excited in the first place about being in the business of education, what is exciting you about the potential of what um, what is to come? What is the future of education? For me, it's that we won't be in the box anymore. Ah. <laughs> we, will, we will be able to learn under the tree. We can use a tree to teach the children. It won't just be chalk and talk anymore. Oh. And I do believe that socialization oh, talk anymore, I love it. <laughs> I do believe socialization is very important, and yes, especially for young children. And that's why when we were, um, oh, that's why when we were doing the online for Billing Blocks, it was important to me to deliver the packages at the end of each week because I actually got to see the kids because they were seeing me on a computer every day, Monday to Thursday. And when they got to see me in person, I mean, they couldn't. I had on my mask, they couldn't touch me, but they could at least wave. Yes. So yes. for them, it is very important to see your teacher, to speak to your teacher, to have that connection. And luckily, I didn't have any new students online when I was doing online because online started in March. But I don't know how difficult it would be for a new student to go into a situation where they're learning. I mean, I do know because I saw it with Billing Blocks, but with Reach. But such a small child, an 18 month to four year old, to have to meet me for, for the first time online. Yes. But you know, um, as as we're even thinking about what the future holds, it's it's amazing to to see even some of these young kids just being able to sit in front of a tablet, even for a short time. Um, in terms of what the next generation is going to be looking at, and as parents are looking at the next generation, um, from where you sit as an educator, how do educators need to see the future of education? So technology is very important, and children are able to sit in front of a computer, and they are able to sit in front of a tablet, but they also have to have life skills, which is very important. So... A, B, C, one, two, three, great also, but do they know how to say please and thank you and talk to their friends and share? So for me, we have to continue with moving forward where we're incorporating everything in the learning process and not just A, B, C, one, two, three, computers. Yes. And I, I'm, I think that COVID has brought to parents the reality that it has to, we have to all work together for our students to learn. It's not just the teachers, um, just the teacher doing all the work. We have to work as a team to have the children learn. That's the best solution for every child. The best solution. I see Alana says COVID has been a building block for learning. Sure <laughs> <laughs> Jody Williams, who is owner of Building Blocks and Reach Academy. Thank you very much for joining us. And as we move from just not just chalk, how we say it again? Chalk and talk. Chalk and talk. Talk. <laughs> um, I see I see more comments. Vanessa says, moving forward, I'm excited to see how empowered our teachers are. The community is seeing and valuing our teachers and what they have to offer. A true Vanessa, because the parents, them never even understand what their children were like in the classroom. So there's our whole, there is now really a, an ecosystem. And Dr. Colette Smith says, those in-person social skills are crucial. 
Thank you very much for joining us. We just spoke with Jody Williams, um, owner of Building Blocks and Reach Academy. We have spoken to Gordon Swaby, who is CEO of Edufocal. We also spoke to um, Dr. Renee Ratris, CEO of Teach Good, Lead Good on this, the business of education. We've talked about partnership in learning. We've talked about, we have had to talk about socializing and, and how we will move in this online space that we'll never go back to where we were, but we do have to recognize some of the important building blocks in learning. So thank you very much for joining us. We are here every Thursday on COVID Cast JA. Our sponsors, NCB Group, JMMB Group, are committed to our ability to provide the information on a weekly basis. I want to tell you this week's memo is talking about the business of education, but I'm going to share something else with you. It actually talks to you about general business and business modeling because, you know, we incorporate everything in this learning. So email us at sme at psoj.org so that you can get our weekly memo. You can find us on Facebook, on YouTube, follow us on Instagram so that you can know what is coming next week again. What time? 7.30 for COVID cast JA, another exciting episode as we discuss the business, the business during COVID, how we will move forward, what does the future look like. A production of the PSOJ, Private Sector Organization of Jamaica. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Great to have you back and we will continue to have interesting discussions. So see you next week for another episode of COVID cast JA. So you have a great idea to start a business, but you don't know where to start. We completely understand. You have a lot of questions and almost no answers. Smallbusinessportal.com is here to help. At smallbusinessportal.com, you gain access to information on loans, grants, and investment opportunities from verified financial institutions. Guess what you also get? Useful business tips, access to training, all these services combine to make your business idea into a reality. Start your journey today at smallbusinessportal.com. Do you want to level up your business? Level up. Join us on COVID Cast JA every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube at PSOJ Financial Access Jamaica. And don't forget to follow us on all socials to interact with our weekly polls and Q&As.